Good morning, everyone. I'm Ed Long, uh, Head of Events, uh, Reuters Events Sustainable Business. Um, welcome to this webinar on Building Today for Resilient Tomorrow, uh, which is run in partnership with Liberty Mutual Insurance. Um, today, we've got a great discussion and we've got some an incredible panel to go with that as well. Um, we've got Dr. Kelly Hirid, uh, the Director of Catastrophe Research and Development, Emerging Risk Management at Liberty Mutual. Pamela Williams, Executive Director at Build, Build Strong Coalition. Aaron Davis, who's a staff di director, subcommittee on economic development, public buildings and emergency management at the US House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. And Angela Gladwell, the director of hazard mitigation assistance at FEMA. This is also moderated um, expertly by Raki Kumar, who's the SVP of sustainability solutions um, for the Office of Sustainability at Liberty Mutual Insurance. Before I hand over, um, a little bit of housekeeping. We are looking to make this as interactive as possible. Um, at the bottom, you'll see a toolbar uh, where you'll see a Q&A feature. Please do get your questions in on that um, through that toolbar throughout the uh, discussion. And we'll aim to get those answered for you at the end of the hour. Um, and again, this is also being recorded. Uh, so you'll be able to listen back at your leisure. And for now, I'd like to hand over to, to Raki to, to moderate this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ed, and hello and welcome everyone to today's uh, discussion. Uh, before we get started, I really wanted to uh, address why we at Liberty were interested in holding or uh, hosting this discussion. Uh, at Liberty, we get to see firsthand how climate change is really impacting our policyholders. As of July of this year, US has already experienced eight major climate disasters with losses exceeding a billion dollars each. And this does not even cover the immeasurable damage that communities, um, that it has done for communities and lives of individuals. And so today, uh, I'm hoping that uh, with this discussion, we actually, it helps us uh, taking action and towards more mitigation. Um, and uh, what we're hoping is to explore topics such as why resiliency matters to insurance companies, as well as uh, how can it help our communities? Uh, what are some public stakeholders, uh, such as governments and associations, doing about climate resiliency? And finally, exploring some of the resources that are available to build for the future, uh, with a special focus on understanding the policy and legislative efforts underway. So uh, with that, I'm uh, really going to kick off the conversation. Uh, thank, uh, Kelly, let's start with you. Um, help us set the stage, um, you know, Talk to me a bit more about the role, your role at Liberty and what your team is seeing with um, related to impacts of climate change on the build environment. Sure, hi everybody. So my team works in catastrophe modeling, research and development. So really our role is to take apart catastrophe models, which are the tools that the insurance and reinsurance industry uses to essentially assess our biggest, meanest, ugliest, disasters, whether they're natural or otherwise. So as you might imagine, that means that a significant part of our work is involved with evaluating the impact of climate to develop forward-looking views of physical hazard. So obviously climate affects really an enormous variety of different hazards. And so how do you prioritize where to focus your attention and where to start? Well, how do you eat an elephant is one bite at a time. So in my team, we really focus on the types of hazards that are going to have clear and immediate impacts in both the current and very near future climate, because that's at the time scale where insurers have tools that are readily available to allow us to assess our near-term risk and are actually actionable within our business and actionable for our clients. So for us, that means primarily focusing on hurricane, water-related perils like flood and wildfire. So on the hurricane side, we do a lot of work assessing the impacts of hurricane frequency and intensity, particularly for the most intense storms, because we expect that very intense storms like we just saw with Hurricane Ida will potentially be increasing in frequency in the future. The other really low hanging fruit for climate related impacts on hurricanes is coming from storm surge, because it turns out that while the storm surges themselves from hurricanes probably aren't changing all that much, they sit on top of a platform of higher sea level. So every single storm surge is a little bit higher and reaches a little bit further inland because it's sitting on top of higher uh, mean sea levels. This also has impacts on flood risk, both coastal flood, so what we think of as sunny day or nuisance flooding, which can be uh, can impact 
communities on sort of a broad scale over sort of near and medium term timeframes, as well as things like flash flood, where you have an interaction between an increase in extreme rainfall uh, as what and that interacts with our built environment because you get increases in rainfall coming in. And then as you pave over your cities, there is nowhere for that rainfall to go. So those compound and you can get very extreme flash floods like what we saw in the Northeast. The last one that we look at is primarily wildfire, which is a, a particularly tough nut to crack. We're seeing increases in hazard tied with wildfire that are primarily driven by increases in temperature. So increases in temperature are one of our clearest climate related impacts. So that you know, is, is a, a pretty nice bright line that we can tie to wildfire. The problem is that while you see very large increases in burn area related to temperature, it's hard to tie that with actual changes in damage. And so you have to really focus in on wind driven events, uh, things like Santa Ana driven, where we've had several of our largest uh, wildfires in history within the last couple of years. So we take apart these hazards and look at them in our, in our near-term timeframe because we don't wanna be assessing climate risk out in 2100 because while you can look at it out at that timeframe, that doesn't actually help us with making decisions. And we wanna make sure that we can then take that risk and make sure that our business units and our clients and our partners can understand that risk for themselves. For example, if we have clients who are sitting at three feet above sea level, we wanna make sure that they understand that that doesn't mean well, I don't have to worry about flood risk until 2100 because they will experience that change in risk in terms of changes in coastal flood frequency long before their front, their front door is underwater in 2100. So we really see insurance as having a key role as climate translation. So understanding this rapidly evolving climate science literature and translating in those into the impacts and how we expect that they will be felt on the ground. So, as we saw in the aftermath of Hurricane Ida and many related disasters here through this year and recent years, we're really dealing with a massive amount of increase in extreme hazards today. So we need building codes and infrastructure that is not designed for the weather of the past, but the weather of the future, and we need it now. Thanks. Thanks, Kelly. Um, Angela. Can you elaborate on the agency's perspective of evolving impacts of climate on our communities? Sure. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to join you uh, today and, and talk a little bit about um, what we are seeing uh, in FEMA as it relates to, to climate change. And I can say as, as emergency managers, uh, we have seen the impacts of climate change uh, directly. I've personally been with FEMA for 22 years. And just over that period of time, uh, you can see uh, the, the changes uh, that are being felt throughout, throughout the country, uh, increased precipitation, wildfires, heat events, sea level rise have all caused monumental problems uh, nationwide. The extreme drought in the western part of the nation, ensuing fire season continue to grow and get worse. Uh, and on the opposite side of the spectrum, we suffered the worst hurricane season in history last year with over 30 named storms. Hurricane Ida recently exceeded our expectations, uh, impacting Louisiana um, significantly, as well as um, many other parts of the country and the Northeast. Um, so one side of our country is burning, the other side has too much water, an issue we were just talking about a few minutes ago was the rapid intensification of Hurricane Ida and the impact that that has on things like evacuations um, uh, of, of our communities and how that's changing the needs for um, our first responders. Some communities are facing new risks that they've never faced before, such as wildfire or drought. And so they need to be able to quickly learn mitigation and resilience strategies from others who have experienced them in the past. And some communities are facing an increase in severity, such as tremendous amounts of rainfall in a short period of time that are taxing their already strained infrastructure. And more and more communities are facing another event before they fully recovered from the previous. And we know that those impacts are not felt equally. Some people are disproportionately impacted by the impacts of climate change and they need our assistance the most. 
So these issues are, are demanding that, that we, and by, by we, I mean all of us, take some new approaches to mitigation and resilience. Um, we know we need to increase our investment in mitigation and resilience. Um, that's, uh, that is uh, a given. But fundamentally, it also means we need to build the consideration of risk, resilience, adaptation strategies into all of our planning and investment decisions across both the public and the private sector. Through inclusive planning processes, we can work collaboratively to develop and implement risk reduction strategies that focus on our most significant problems and risks. And we're finding that the problems are really complex and they require coordinated and community-wide solutions, which tap into multiple sources of funding, programs, financial tools, and technical assistance. And this approach is at the heart of our national mitigation investment strategy. Back in 2019, uh, we developed this strategy. Um, it was developed by the Mitigation Framework Leadership Group, an interagency body that works on mitigation policy led by SEMA. And it was developed to be a single national strategy for the whole community to effectively uh, and efficiently advance the practice of mitigation investment in the United States uh, to increase the nation's resilience to natural hazards and ultimately build a culture of preparedness. Because we know that effective mitigation investments can save lives and money. Uh, the uptake in natural hazards has led us to reevaluate our hazard mitigation grant program. We have aligned all of our grant programs through a strategic framework um, based on this national mitigation investment strategy. And this gives us a North Star for us to increase community resilience and protect human life and property with climate considerations and equity uh, both in mind. Uh, this guides our, our efforts to build a more resilient nation. And we've built in uh, equity and incorporating future conditions, such as changes in land use, climate, and communities all into our work. And it also reflects our focus on community resilience. We recognize and want to support the needs for communities to consider a system-wide approach to mitigation, which is a, a resilient strategy that mitigates the risk to critical sectors of a community and builds community-wide resilience to natural hazards. And if you've heard our administrator speak, uh, it's a term that she uses quite a bit as she talks about system-based mitigation. So again, implementing this national mitigation investment strategy is not a federal only task. In order to address these problems before us, we need everyone, citizens, communities, states, tribes, private sector, federal government, to work together to do everything they can to reduce disaster suffering. And that's why the system-based mitigation is an important key in finding ways to, to link, leverage, and align what we're already doing to meet these goals. Also, focusing on infrastructure um, has been good for the country. The resilience efforts post Katrina in Louisiana, for example, proved beneficial to hundreds of thousands. Um, not only uh, the Army Corps um, flood walls on their levee systems uh, as an important structural infrastructure, um, but also all of the other collective mitigation efforts that took place to um, address uh, transportation, housing, um, and other, um, uh, other critical issues. Um, in the impacted area. So our hazard mitigation assistance programs are focused on improving lifelines infrastructure. Um, you know, again, another example from Louisiana is Ida did a, a number on communication lines, cutting millions off from electricity. Many will be without power, some for potentially a month or longer. And this emphasizes the very essence of what our grant programs are designed to do. They're meant to protect populations from the impacts of future conditions. And FEMA has a very long history of funding projects meant to help communities become more resilient to climate change. Uh, our hazard mitigation grant program has funded numerous community projects across the country. We have a mitigation action portfolio, which talks about many of our innovative projects, ranging from microgrids to stormwater containment, to more simple projects like generators, all efforts to make communities more resilient to future storm activity. 
And we'll talk a little bit more about our BRIC, BRIC program, but that also allows us to bolster our effort to battle climate change and prioritizes activities that mitigate the risk to one or more community lifelines, such as hospitals, roads, communication systems, among others. Um, one thing that you'll hear us talk about, and again, I know we're going to be focused on uh, BRIC later today, is that all of our HMA assistance programs play a role in helping communities see the benefits of um, accomplishing mitigation and also of adopting the best building codes and standards. We do see building code adoption as a very high value mitigation measure for all communities. Um, and in fact, as part of the effort to reform federal disaster programs and build the nation's capacity to better mitigate the impacts of catastrophic events, the BRIC program prioritizes and incentivizes the adoption and enforcement of building codes. So uh, thank you, I'll turn things back over to you and we can talk about more about the BRIC program a little later. Thanks, Angela. So Kelly, I'm gonna bring you back in here. Um, so it's clear that climate change and its impacts are part of our future. Uh, from an insurance uh, company perspective, can you talk a bit about the role resilient buildings play in mitigating climate risk? You know, it's interesting. We tend to think of climate risk as being a future problem, something that we're going to have to deal with down the line. But I think we're, you know, as we're hearing, it's very clear that this is already happening now. And we really are going to have to walk and chew gum at the same time. We're going to have to work on reducing emissions and pair that with building in climate adaptation, because there's a certain amount of climate risk that is baked in today that we are going to have to adapt to and live with as a society. So from an insurance perspective, we want to make sure that we are, are developing forward-looking views of risk, but also that we are figuring out ways to mitigate the risk that is already coming. Because we don't wanna just say, you know, we're just going to try and be chasing after an increase in hazard forever. You know, right now we don't experience things like hurricanes in the same way that we would in the past. So our tools that we actually use can take account of things like increases and in improvements in building codes. So for example, one of the most disastrous hurricanes in history was the Great Miami hurricane, which as you might imagine, Miami looked very different in the 1920s when it hit as opposed to when it hits today. So we can't just think that we will see increases in loss as we have more people moving to the coasts, more people moving to areas of high hazard. There was a recent report arguing that one in three Americans have experienced a climate related disaster this year. So with that all in mind, we, need to, we now have tools that can account for how we are improving our building stock for the disasters that we're living with now. This is where insurers really have an opportunity to step to the plate because they can say, you know, we can actually quantify and tell you how much it helps to improve your building codes. And we have seen over and over again that the money that's invested in building resiliently pays dividends for years and decades down the line in re reduced disaster costs. So that benefits our clients, it benefits our consumers, it benefits our communities, and it benefits us, right? That is a, you know, that is as close as you can get to a win-win situation in climate adaptation is putting in the investments now to building codes and to infrastructures, because otherwise we are going to be paying for it later and it's going to cost a lot more in both money as well as lives and impacts to communities. Thanks for that. Um, Aaron, uh, we've heard a lot about the need for resilient buildings. Uh, what provisions are, are there in the bipartisan Senate infrastructure legislation that will help our communities increase their resilience capabilities? Thanks, Rocky. Um, and thank you for the invitation to participate today. Um, so in the bipartisan infrastructure bill, I think the, the most significant um, provision related to FEMA and its hazard mitigation assistance programs. Um, well, there, there are two in particular. There's $3.5 billion for the flood mitigation assistance uh, program, um, which I believe will be probably one of the largest historical infusions of cash into FMA ever. Um, there's additionally $500 million to seed uh, a new state revolving loan fund program uh, focused on hazard mitigation projects that the Congress enacted at the end of the 116th Congress. 
Um, there's also uh, a significant infusion of funds for high hazard potential dam uh, rehabilitation programs uh, to a magnitude that um, would take decades to achieve in, you know, via regular appropriations process. Um, so I think from that perspective, in the bipartisan deal um, in the in the FEMA space uh, related to mitigation. I think um, there's some frustration uh, with um, opportunities that we may have missed in the bipartisan deal to ensure um, that we are uh, codifying the need across all of the investments that are being made to build better, to build stronger. Um, and that's something that we are looking to address uh, in the reconciliation package to the degree that we can. Um, the House carried language in uh, Chairman DeFazio's Invest Act earlier this year and uh, last year um, that would have ensured all uh, DOT investments uh, across the nation were built to a higher standard. Um, that's something that we're looking to do in the reconciliation package as well. We're also looking at um, some additional funds for the state revolving loan fund grants in the reconciliation package, as well as uh, a dedicated stream of funding to, uh, to FEMA for uh, building code adoption enforcement and implementation uh, grant program. Um, I think that's, uh, as uh, Angela mentioned, paramount is ensuring that um, communities are building to uh, the latest codes and standards um, that has been demonstrated to, to provide the, the greatest return on investment when it comes to federal mitigation investments. Uh, and that is something that we're committed to putting some additional resources in. Thanks, Aaron. Pam, you've been very patient. Let's bring you into the conversation. We know Bill Strong has been very active in this area and we're members of Bill Strong. And um, the Senate proposal is only part of this conversation, but um, can you share with us what your coalition is working on with regards to legislation that will be introduced in the House and how is resilient building part of these conversations? Thank you so much. And thank you so much for hosting this, this really important conversation that is so very timely. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the tremendous partnerships and efforts that um, are being undertaken by both FEMA and our policy leadership um, in the House and the Senate. Um, Aaron and, and the members that he works for have been tremendous partners in a very bipartisan way so that we can continue to build on what happened in 2018 in the wake of what we thought then were the historic storms of 2017. Um, and so we're building on the Disaster Recovery Reform Act that did um, really change the way this country started thinking about investing in disaster resilience before a disaster. And I'm so excited that we are going to talk about FEMA's BRIC program that they stood up in the wake of the Disaster Recovery Reform Act and how that has really started to transform not only the conversation, as Angie said, about systemic investment in resilience, but truly in the way that we are thinking about how we target communities. And this is the conversation that the insurance industry, as Kelly said, is so critical communicating risk to individuals, to communities, to businesses, to organizations, to regions, and ultimately the country. Because historically as a country, we've done a pretty lousy job at adequately communicating the true risk that people face. So in partnership with these great folks, the Build Strong Coalition is working in a very bipartisan way because these are not partisan issues. Disasters don't only hit red or blue states, but truly to drive more resources to mitigation. And in this historic time when we have seen efforts to put more resources on the table than ever before, truly to build capacity and capability at that local level to identify risk and to identify risk reducing cost effective. We've already talked a lot about that return on investment. I'm going to throw the data out there. The National Institute of Building Sciences say for building codes, we get an 11 to 1 return. I don't know about you guys, but there aren't many things that I'm investing in where I see that kind of return on investment. And we're not only talking about a return and, and the good use of taxpayer dollars, 
ultimately, we are talking about saving lives, livelihoods, property, and ultimately the economic vitality of our communities. So we are working to drive more resources to um, FEMA's programs specifically directed at pre-disaster mitigation and ultimately the BRIC program. And again, these are going to be resources that are more evergreen, that we don't have to fight year after year for appropriations. And in this country, what have we seen? We only kind of pay attention to this in the wake of a catastrophic disaster. So how do we keep that flow, those investments, that focus evergreen so that we aren't doing this ebb and flow only in the wake of catastrophic disaster years and that we're constantly thinking about how we can draw down risks in our communities. Also, as we've already mentioned, the importance of building codes. And while FEMA has very much done things for actually years to get people focused on the importance of building codes, we really need to provide resources to allow communities to walk that walk. How do they identify that they are a community that needs to strengthen their building codes? How do they work with local elected officials, your community, your stakeholders to bring those building codes online? And then the very important piece, how do we enforce those? So FEMA is taking a very kind of bifurcated look at this in the sense like, how do we drive building codes in the wake of a disaster so that we're rebuilding well, smart, better, but also how do we line communities up so that they're prepared when the unthinkable happens? Because it's not a question of if, it is a question of when. And finally, the key piece to what we are dubbing the Resilient America Act is focusing on residential resilience. Not only do we need a systemic investment in things like key lifeline infrastructure, but we really need to help address the existing housing stock in this country. There's a tremendous number of buildings and homes that are out of code, aren't built to the highest codes and standards. And guess what? Our friends at the Institute for Building and Home Safety have shown us there are key retrofits that, that homeowners can invest in and that we as organizations and government can help individuals invest in that strengthen their home and let them survive the next disaster. And that's everything from roof tie downs to roof deck ceilings, to cripple wall um, stabilization in earthquake scenarios. And we're learning more and more every day, particularly in the wildfire scenario. What can we do to give homeowners the tools to protect themselves and ultimately to be a key piece to the protection of their communities? So I'm very excited that we've had so much excitement and enthusiasm and support from our stakeholders and hopefully we'll continue to drive policymakers in this country to set up the right federal framework so that we can build a strong nation. Thanks, Pam. I just wanted to remind everyone uh, that if you have any questions, please do feel free to put it into the chat box. We will get to them at the end of the session. Uh, so continuing the conversation, Angela, let's get back to you. Um, can, you provide, uh, can you provide an introduction to the uh, Building Resilient Infrastructure Communities or BRIC program? And what are some of the projects that were approved under BRIC funding so that people get an idea as to what they can come to you for? Absolutely. I'm happy to, to talk about the, the BRIC program and, you know, just to build off of what both Aaron and Pam said, it, it truly is a really exciting time to work in the space of mitigation and resilience because it really, this, again, despite the challenges that we frame that are out there, we just have this amazing opportunity to, to really be able to um, invest in a more resilient nation and reduce disaster suffering and future disaster costs and having a pre-disaster program and an investment in that, that program that can be utilized to, to catalyze that investment really is, um, is a significant opportunity. So uh, just to, to share with you for the first year of the program, which was um, in 2020, um, we had $500 million um, in the um, in the BRIC program. Uh, the president um, in late spring um, announced that the program was going to be at the billion dollar level for 2021, um, which I just have to share is um, one part of almost $5 billion in mitigation funding uh, that was announced to be available um, this summer. One billion in BRIC, um, 160 million in the flood mitigation assistance uh, program, which uh, Aaron mentioned, 
Um, and then a historic announcement of $3.46 billion in the Hazard Mitigation and Grant Program um, for COVID, which is available to 59 states and territories. So, uh, so, uh, so BRIC is one piece of, of that larger mitigation uh, puzzle. So um, the BRIC program, again, was launched in 2020, funds, um, funds innovative projects, many of which align with community lifelines. So community leaders in energy, communication, transportation, health and human services, all can really think about projects that will protect critical infrastructure for communities and cities. You know, for example, energy resilience has that cascading effect on building resilience in communities, um, particularly for those uh, that are smaller and, and more rural areas. BRIC, uh, we see as very much a uh, capability and capacity building program as well. Um, uh, so it encourages that uh, capability and capacity building to mitigate risks from natural hazards by cultivating shared responsibility for investing in mitigation, encouraging uh, that culture of resilience, building local and state and tribal capacity, and developing the partnerships across the public and private sector that are absolutely critical for long-term success. It also recognizes the growing hazards associated with climate change and the need for mitigation activities that promote resilience and adaptation with respect to those hazards. Um, in our inaugural year, FEMA selected 22 projects under the national competition that scored the highest based on the 200 point competition criteria. Of the 22 projects selected, 18 of them included nature-based solutions. Many of the projects are located in coastal states, which are most at risk from sea level rise and other climate related changes. And inland, FEMA selected numerous projects that focus on fixing infrastructure to improve community resilience from system breakdown or service disruption. Which will, which will benefit hundreds of thousands of people. So I wanna give you just a few examples of some of the 2020 project selections for the BRIC program. In Southeast Washington, DC, a project to reduce stormwater overflow and leverage green spaces will prevent sewer overflow, stop closures of roads that provide access to hospitals and for emergency vehicles and provide new parks and green space for residents. In Sonoma County, California, a new resilience project creates buffers to wildfire, decreases spread of wildfire, improves forest health, and encourages residents to create their own defenses to prevent the cascading effects of wildfire. And I know if you've recently saw this, but they were talking about what saved um, Tahoe um, uh, just in the past week. And they were talking about how critical the individual mitigation efforts were in people's homes to actually um, saving, saving Tahoe from the, the wildfire. In several parts of the country, leveraging infrastructure and nature-based solutions like revetment, live shoreline, green space, and other methodologies has the combined effect of preventing damage to critical infrastructure, improving the environment, creating green space, and other benefits like improved drinking water quality, sewage flow reduction, and many other human health benefits. We're really encouraged by the project selections that are um, uh, that occurred this year. Um, a couple things that are really important for for you to know um, as you as you think about um, uh, applying to the BRIC program uh, in the future. One is the notice of funding opportunities again are out there. Um, you can start applying um, as of October first, and that runs through the end of uh, that application period runs through the end of January. Uh, we do have a set of both technical and qualitative criteria that really, um, again, are form the basis of that 200 point um, selection um, process. And so it's really important for, for you to become familiar with that. We have a whole webinar series that we've been uh, rolling out um, starting the summer through uh, the end of this month. Those are all available to you um, on our website. So that break down the specific criteria for the program and help walk you through them. 
it's really important if you're developing an application just to become familiar with those criteria and what they mean so that you can be best positioned for success if you're going to um, apply for the program. The other thing just to share is BRIC is one of two programs this year along with our flood mitigation assistance program that is a pilot under the administration's Justice 40 initiative. Um, and so if you're not familiar with Justice 40, it was created by the executive order on the climate crisis. And its goal is to be able to ensure that our programs are targeting 40% of the benefits um, of our programs to disadvantaged communities. And so uh, we will be serving, uh, Brick will be a, a pilot in that program and you will see um, in uh, both things like the direct technical assistance um, that we um, are making available, as well as on our criteria that we have, um, we have made some revisions to that criteria this year to address the needs of disadvantaged communities. So um, with that, I will pause there um, and I can answer anything else in follow-up questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I see a lot of questions are coming in fast and furious, but um, uh, Aaron and Pam, um, Many of attendees here are from states and local communities. Can you share some of the observations and lessons learned from the first year? And do you have any advice for accessing these resources that um, Angela has just mentioned? Sure. Um, so I think from a congressional perspective, um, there has been some frustration expressed to us on the part of uh, members who represent areas that were not selected as part of the initial uh, brick funding uh, round um, and the geographic disparities. Uh, there is a, uh, we, are, we have heard that um, there's a lot of concern about the uh, focus on coastal areas and not so much on inland uh, riverine uh, vulnerable communities. Um, that said, I, we are, uh, you know, hopeful that uh, future years will, um, provide more geographic diversity uh, in the, the program selections. Um, and we're also looking at ways to uh, further boost that dedicated stream of funding uh, to the BRIC program so that um, as Pam and, and Angela already mentioned, it, it's not reliant upon uh, and a standalone appropriation and um, looking to boost that 6% set aside that currently exists to something greater. Uh, we are doing that, as Pam said, in a bipartisan way um, in the, the forthcoming Resilient America bill. Um, I think the other um, frustration that we've seen is that despite these resources, there are still uh, some states that have, uh, or a state that has failed to take advantage of this incredible new resource. Uh, and, you know, we've had some conversations with Angela and, and the team at FEMA about um, how to engage with all states, tribes, territories, and local governments to ensure that they are fully aware of the incredible resources that are out there across the HMA programs, including BRIC, um, as well as the technical assistance that exists for those uh, smaller and, and more vulnerable communities. Um, we held a hearing in July of last year, uh, looking at the experience of uh, uh, underserved and vulnerable populations um, during and after disaster. And um, that is something that we're also looking at uh, developing some, we have some legislation in draft form, bipartisan legislation that will hopefully be bicameral as well, that would provide some more uh, direction to FEMA to prioritize mitigation resources based on its own national risk index, which was uh, released in November of last year, um, detailing uh, sort of the highest risk uh, areas across the country um, that are vulnerable to 18 natural hazards. So that is something that um, you know Congress is paying attention to, and uh, we look forward to providing additional resources to FEMA so that we can get those resources out into these communities as quickly as possible. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, to, to add to that, um, I'm going to I'm going to take away some of Angie's thunder. So so let's talk about what FEMA saw in 2020, the inaugural year of the BRIC grant program. So in a year 2020, you might say that our state and local governments were historically taxed, um, had very little bandwidth for 
new requirements, new applications, efforts focused on disaster mitigation. And guess what? FEMA saw over 990 applications to mitigate over 1,500 structures. That would have been a total application cost of over five and a half billion dollars for a grant program that in its inaugural year had 500 million. So that is pretty darn exciting. And if we were looking for evidence that this is a need, this is a priority in our local governments, here it is. And that's why we're so glad that policymakers are continuing to drive more resources to these sorts of investments. And again, on FEMA's part, they aren't stove piping all programs into just one set of funding. They are looking to be creative and across the resources that are available, not only from FEMA, but other federal agencies to direct those applications to the right source of funding. So when there are creative solutions that can only be met through something like brick funding, that that's where that money is targeted. And so I would say that probably the most notable thing in, in 2020 that we saw FEMA focusing on was certainly that capacity building. We see a lot of focus on, on planning and prioritization because we do, as a nation, we really do need to bring that capability um, back into priority for our local governments. FEMA is doing a tremendous job with these technical assistance teams that they're expanding in 2021. Again, to both get at the equity piece, but to help these communities on the ground that are facing the greatest risk, risk find the best solutions. And then I would probably say that one of the most exciting things that we are seeing, and this is really, again, where the insurance sector can absolutely come to bear is creative partnerships. Get to the table. FEMA is fostering now the, the efforts of multiple lines of funding, multiple parties, both public and private sector that can come together to invest in that systemic solution. So insurance sector needs to get to the table, start providing the conversations about risk and the data that you're seeing. And guess what? You guys are plugged into better creative solutions than most local officials have even heard about. I am still encountering local governments that are like, wait, there are federal resources out there. Wait, there are industries that want to help us solve this problem. Yes. So get to the table because again, as we've seen, insurance companies can absolutely help communities adopt building codes, start that conversation in local communities. The insurance sector has such a tremendous network of those intimate local relationships with individuals, with communities, and with regions that really the federal government just can't transplant in any way, shape, or form. So I'm excited to see by FEMA fostering these creative relationships, what we're truly able to do to leverage this federal money as truly seed money. And with private investment, nonprofit investment, individual investment layered on top of it, how we're really going to be able to transform the country. Thanks, I could just build, Rocky, if I could just build on one thing that Pam mentioned. Um, I think one of the things that has uh, hampered uh, congressional efforts in the past has been sort of the stove piping of jurisdictions and um, a committee's ability to only work on programs within its purview. And uh, I'd say that um, in the wake of 2017 uh, and 2018 disaster seasons and everything that we've uh, endured since, there is much more communication between committees that have jurisdiction over um, complementary uh, federal disaster and mitigation programs to ensure that um, they are operating uh, in concert or working to operate in better concert uh, moving forward. So that means conversations between the Transportation Committee and the Financial Services Committee, um, which has oversight over not only the Flood Mitigation Assistance Program at FEMA, but also HUD's CDBG DR program and uh, Community Disaster Block Grant mitigation program at HUD, um, working um, as well with uh, our counterparts on the Ways and Means Committee to see if there are um, investment vehicles that can help drive that, um, that uh, needed private investment in bonds and communities that could fund resilience and mitigation projects. So these are all conversations that are happening on the legislative side as well to ensure that um, FEMA and these communities have uh, all of the tools that they're available at their fingertips to um, constructively finance uh, these necessary investments. 
Thanks, Aaron. So, uh, Pam, first question goes to you. You mentioned that uh, we need to help community leaders understand that they may uh, that they may need to strengthen building codes. Uh, since we have some of those people on the call today, can you elaborate on what some of these parameters may be? Well, first and foremost, let me make clear that we are talking about the standard consensus-based, you know, model building codes, right? Like we aren't talking about just implementing any building code. We are talking about the latest, greatest modern building codes because what we've seen from our friends at the um, at the ICC is that really they are constantly engaged in that conversation. What are the best techniques? What are the best guidances that we need to give to our communities for creating a stronger, built, newly built environment? And so that is really not only does the insurance sector truly bring a level of expertise and knowledge, but experience in this conversation, right? Like this is where you guys, the your business is founded on these concepts. So it really does help in the translation and helping our stakeholders understand that we're not kidding. This is really a, not only a very important conversation, but it, it's, it saves money. It saves lives, and we've seen that time and time again. And I do think that the insurance sector is one of the best mouthpieces to help communicate that um, at an individual and community level. So again, I would say get to the table, um, help um, communities understand what we're talking about when we talk about the latest consensus-based codes um, for the built environment, but also help them understand what resources can be available to help retrofit homes. Because we will always have more existing structures in this home than in this country than new, um, newly built structures. So how do we protect those that have older structures that weren't built to code? You know, I think you know Florida is one of the best examples when Florida adopted the strongest building codes in the country and started building out of concrete block. You know, a lot of people said, oh, this is going to halt development. Developers, you know, it's going to be cost prohibitive. But what we've seen time and time again is these increased standards do not significantly increase the overall cost of homes or buildings to individuals. And what do we get on the return? An 11 to 1 return on costs avoided to recover, rebuild, bounce back from these disasters that are truly inevitable. Thanks, Pam. Um, Angela, question, uh, Ramaya asks if you could quickly elaborate on the Sonoma County program that, that you'd mentioned in your uh, remarks. Um, I don't have a whole lot of additional information that I, I can give you right now, but I'm happy to, to send something out that kind of summarizes the project. I mean, I, again, it's a wildfire risk reduction um, project in Sonoma County, uh, California, that really represents um, a lot of uh, innovation in terms of wildfire mitigation. Um, so uh, I'm happy to I'm ha happy to send out some more information if you're you're interested in the follow up. Thanks, um, Kelly. Uh, can you share examples of uh, of what a resilient building solution would look like for preventing impacts from hurricanes such as Ida, and what uh, can we be asking from our community leaders today to prepare for in the future? Sure. Well, I, I think it's worth starting off and saying, when you have a 150 mile an hour hurricane, you're probably not going to prevent all damage. So let's just set the appropriate baseline there. But I think Ida is a really excellent example that shows the intersection between community scale resilience and individual scale resilience. In Louisiana, in the area where the landfall actually happened, New Orleans had invested something like $14.5 billion in upgrading and rebuilding their levees in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. And that looked like a pretty big price tag at the time. That levee probably just paid for itself in one storm, in one storm. So it doesn't really matter if you're doing everything right on, you know, making sure your roof is nailed down appropriately or whatever, if you're 10 feet underwater because the levee protecting your community failed. So we have to do mitigation together, individuals and communities. That being said, there's also important things that you can do to make sure that your home survives a wind event. So the most important thing to do to protect your home in a wind event is protect the roof, because if you lose the roof, you've probably destroyed the property. So there are a lot, you know, the, the example of the Florida building code is a great example because the different ages of buildings and the high frequency of hurricanes that you see in Florida 
means you can actually see the impacts of building codes play out in real time. So in the aftermath of Hurricane Irma, which hit the Florida Keys as a category four hurricane before hitting the rest of Florida as a category three, you could actually see pictures where there were homes that were next door neighbors to each other, where some older homes that were built with gable roofs, meaning two sides, had completely lost the roofs. The roofs were gone, rain had infiltrated, those homes were probably near total losses. Next door neighbor has a gable roof, meaning four sides, or a hip roof, meaning four sides. That home may be lost a few shingles. We can build for extreme events if we include that kind of information in our building codes. We can build for high wind events today if we have the will to do so. Then we saw the exact same impacts play out in the Northeast with the rain impacts of Hurricane Ida. Because again, we need community scale management of extreme rainfall events. You know, it, it doesn't matter if you've built your home appropriately, if your local community doesn't have appropriate stormwater management. And it's really hard to manage stormwater when you're completely paved over and you don't have sort of green spaces that can absorb stormwater as it comes in. So the communities need to be thinking about that and urban metros are particularly susceptible to that sort of high intensity flash flood type of event. That being said, we also need to make sure that we understand where this flood risk is and how it's changing in the future. So up, updating and upgrading flood maps so that people who are sitting in potentially high risk areas know that they are at risk or know that they could be at risk in the future can help them make decisions about investing in their own properties to say, raise them up or put in other flood waterproofing measures to make sure that they as an individual can, can protect their homes and their properties against flood events. So Ida is a great example of community scale infrastructure needing to be right along with individual practices and there are things that we can do on both sides. And we saw that play out in action just a couple of weeks ago. Thanks, Kelly. Angela, questions are coming in fast and furious for you. So um, Weston asks if funding can be pro uh, will be provided for impact assessment oversight of rapid infrastructure development. Is there an uh, effort to develop uh, cumulative effects assessment for infrastructure programs or strategic environment and social assessments at the national level? What, what role will QE, CEQ or EPA play? Okay. okay, so let me provide a little bit of a, just an overall framing. Um, not sure I'm gonna to get to the, be able to answer your, your specific question, but right now we are looking at how we need to continue to evolve our programs and the types of projects that we are funding in order to be able to support the changing needs of climate change. You know, so looking at, we have very broad eligibility in terms of project uh, types that can be funded. Um, part of our challenge is making sure that we can help support the benefit cost analysis and those other things that can help us be able to um, uh, help communities translate that into, um, into projects that, that can be funded. And so that's something that we're working on, not only for BRIC, but across um, our various programs. Because um, I know there's been some other questions about some um, eligible project um, types um, for, for us. Um, uh, the one thing in terms of risk assessments, impact assessments, and other things is a lot of that then gets focused in the, um, the planning um, aspects of things. So planning is an eligible funding activity under all of our hazard mitigation um, assistance programs. And a lot of the, um, the data and the assessments needed to assess risk and understand what the, the impacts um, uh, are to infrastructure or um, uh, other um, uh, lifelines, those kinds of things can be part of that, um, that planning piece. And so um, that's where I would say you'd want to then really work with your um, planners and your local community in terms of um, what makes sense in terms of the mitigation plan. Thanks, Angela. I know you, you took uh, Stephen's question there too. So Kelly, I'm going to try sliding one more question uh, before we close. How do we get much better, fully up-to-date and appropriate predictive information on flood and other hazard risks to federal agencies and state, local, tri tribal, and territorial agencies, as well as public and private sector? Basically, how do we get better data? <laughs> Invest in FEMA's NFIP maps. They need to be updated regularly and not once every 30 or 40 years in some places. Make sure they are accounting for climate risk and are not fully backwards looking. 
and partner with private sector groups that are working on flood modeling today. And they're getting that flood landscape has changed dramatically just in the last five years. There are a ton more modeling groups who are trying to tackle this than was the case before. And I think that we can work across the public and private sector to get a more comprehensive view of flood risk going forward into the future. Thanks, thanks uh, everyone. Uh, I Before I close, uh, I wanted to see if anyone had any other thoughts that they would like to share. All right, you know, to me, this has been a very interesting conversation. I've learned a lot for sure. Um, I wanted to thank our panelists and really close by um, highlighting the three takeaways that, that, were key, that I, you know, for me at least. One was how climate change really impacts different communities differently. There is need for communities uh, for more education around the different types of risks. Every, when we talk about climate change, it's not just one type of risk there. It, different communities can experience hurricanes, storm um, rise, floods, wildfires, and the mitigation that uh, you know, efforts will be very different for different kinds of um, uh, these risks. So I think it's important to go dig deeper and understand what climate change means for your community. Second, the one thing that was very clear was that building codes have give, provide the biggest bang for buck. Um, and that, uh, Pam, I'm going to take your uh, 11 for one return. I want to keep re repeating that, that it's the best return that you can get for your money. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's also, uh, but here the challenge is really about focusing not just on the new buildings, but retrofitting the old buildings and um, updating codes is one thing, but enforcement is equally important to ensure that these building codes are followed. Um, and the third point that was very clearly made was, this is a very complex issue that requires a lot of coordination. Uh, we're at the start of this mitigation journey uh, there are a lot of resources that are being um, diverted or, or provided here uh, by the government. And um, there is a desire to expand as well as provide uh, and, and fund different kinds of projects. And there is, it's, there's really scope for partnership between public and private sector to um, get the mitigation journey, uh, probably the pace of mitigation journey even uh, faster than uh, so that we can catch up and and really protect lives as well as property. So um, thank you very much for uh, you know joining us, uh, joining me in this discussion, and um, uh, hopefully we'll uh, have follow ups uh, later. Thank you. All right, thank you all for for joining. Uh, lastly, from me, I just want to thank the panelists, Angela, Kelly, Aaron. Pamela and also Raki as well for moderating that discussion. Um, you will receive a recording within the next 24 hours of this webinar, um, so you'll be able to watch it back at your leisure as well. So, and lastly, again, thank you uh, for this uh, webinar as well to Liberty Mutual Insurance who have partnered with us on this webinar as well. So thank you very much and uh, see you all next time.